Well, welcome back. In the previous lecture, we reviewed a few important concepts of quantum mechanics. Now, for the most part, we won't need these when we, to understand semiconductors and semiconductor devices. But there are a few cases where an understanding of quantum mechanics becomes important. One of them has to do with a phenomenon we call quantum confinement. That's what I'd like to talk about in this lecture. So this is our time-independent wave equation. Remember, we multiply this by a time-dependent quantity when we want the entire time-dependent and space-dependent wave equation. The, re, remember also that the probability of finding an electron is proportional to psi star psi. That tells us the probability of finding an electron between x and x plus dx. And also remind you that the time-independent wave equation can be written in this form. When the energy is greater than the potential energy, these solutions can be expressed uh, this way in terms of uh, wave number k, and the solutions then are traveling waves, and we've seen the velocities at which they propagate and their wavelengths. We could just as well remember that e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. We could just as well write these solutions as a sine kx plus b cosine kx. If you plug those into this differential equation, you can see that those also work as solutions. So we are free to, to choose whichever one is most convenient for the problem of interest. All right, let's look at a classic quantum mechanics problem. You may have seen this if you've had a little bit of uh, introduction to quantum mechanics previously. This is a particle in a box, and this box goes from zero to some width L. Uh, the potential energy is zero inside the box, but it's, it has infinite barriers in it. An electron cannot get outside of the box. We'll solve our time-independent wave equation. K squared will be given by this relation because U is zero inside the box. We need to solve this equation and then apply the boundary conditions. Those are the two things in solving a second-order differential equation like this, we first find the solutions, and then we apply the boundary conditions. Well, we can write the solutions. It's most convenient to write the solutions in terms of sines and cosines for this problem. And then we have to apply the boundary conditions. In this case, the electron cannot get out of the box. There's no probability that it will be found out, uh, at x less than zero or at x greater than w. So the appropriate boundary conditions are that the wave function has to be zero at the two ends of this box. Those are the boundary conditions that we need to apply. Well, let's go ahead and do that. We'll throw out the cosine kx term because the sine kx term is automatically zero when x is equal to zero. So it satisfies the first of our boundary conditions. So we're set there. But we have another boundary condition that we have to satisfy on the other side. So we have to ensure that when x is equal to w, that sine kx is equal to zero. Well, we know that the sine of pi is zero. The sine of two pi is zero. The sine of any integer number of pi's is zero. So if we take the relation kw is some integer number of pi's, one, two, three, four, however many, any one of those k's will satisfy the second boundary condition as well as satisfying the first. So that leads us to a discrete number of k's. In order to satisfy the boundary condition, we have to restrict the wave vector k to a certain discrete set of values given by this relation. An integer number times pi divided by the width of the will. Okay, now we've satisfied both boundary conditions. So let's look at our solution. We have our wave equation. We have a relation between k squared and energy. We've determined that there are only certain specific values of k that satisfy both boundary conditions. We've identified what those values are. We can solve this relation for those specific values of k squared, and we find that the result is that there are only specific energy levels, quantized energy levels. When j is equal to 1, we get one value. When j is equal to 2, we get another value, and on and on for 3, 4, 5, and the other levels. So quantizing or uh, confining electrons to be in a certain region of space leads to discrete energy levels. This is what's going on in the hydrogen atom. The Coulomb potential confines the electrons to be near the 
the uh, positively charged proton, and that leads to discrete energy levels. The same thing is happening here. The mathematics is just a lot simpler. So just to summarize, quantized electrons, uh, confined electrons, have quantized energies. The, you can see from our relation here that the tighter we can find them, the smaller we make W, the higher those energies are. So if we have a very thin well that we're confining electrons in, the energy states here get pushed up. We can also see that if we have a light mass, we get higher energies. So you might recall that the effective mass of electrons in silicon is a little over one times the electron rest mass. But the effective mass of electrons in germanium is much, much lighter. So we would expect the energy levels to be much higher in gallium arsenide. Now, when we had traveling waves, we talked about normalizing them so that we could uh, just have a wave that described finding one electron in a certain region. Let's say that we have one electron in this quantum well. We would need to normalize this also. So I'll just point out, we'll take our solutions, we'll integrate psi star psi from across the width of the well. That'll give us a sine function. That integral has to be equal to one. That will allow us to determine the constant A. And if you do that, you'll find that the constant A is square root of two over W. So our normalized wave function would have this form, the square root of two over W simply describes, um, ensures us that we're describing one electron in this quantum well. So if we have electrons in this quantum well, what's the electron density? Well, it's going to be proportional to psi star psi. That means it's going to be proportional to sine squared of kx. So we'll find that the electron density inside these quantum wells is far from uniform. It has a sine type behavior. And it's, the electrons will be distributed differently in the first state, the second state, the third state, and so on. For example, if we look at J equals one at the lowest energy level, then we're talking about a sine squared function. The electron will have the highest probability of being found right in the middle of the quantum well. If we look at J equals two at the second quantized level, we'll be talking about a sine squared two pi x over W. This will have a node right in the middle. The electron will have the lowest probability of being found in the center of the quantum well and on and up into higher and higher energy levels. So, so we'll have very non-uniform distributions of electrons inside these quantum wells. Now, a question at this point might need is, might be is, is this an academic exercise or are these really effects that we have to worry about? So the question is, how narrow do we have to make this well in order to see these effects of quantization? And the answer is going to be that when we confine electrons on the same scale as their de Broglie wavelength, then we should expect these effects to become observable and important. So then the question is, what is the wavelength of a mobile electron, say, in a silicon lattice? Well, we can estimate that with a simple back-of-the-envelope calculation like this. We remember that there's a relation between momentum and wave number, p is equal to h bar k. That's a relation, k is two pi over the wavelength. I'll call this lambda b. This is the de Broglie wavelength of the electron. Well, if we could just find p, then we could estimate the wavelength. Well, one way to find p is to recognize that the average thermal energy of an electron at some given temperature t is three halves kt. This describes an electron that is just bouncing around in random thermal motion. That kinetic energy is also p squared over 2m. So if we know the temperature and we know the effective mass, we can solve for the momentum. We can put the momentum in our first equation and solve for the wavelength. If you do that, we get an expression for the wavelength of the electron depends on the effective mass and on the temperature that we're talking about. Plug numbers in for silicon, and we'll find that this is roughly 10 nanometers. So we would need to make a 10 nanometer wide quantum well in order to see these effects start to become observant and, and important. In fact, it's quite easy to produce 10 nanometer quantum wells, so these effects can often become important in semiconductor devices.
And now if we talk about semiconductors that have lighter effective masses, then the confinement will be even stronger and we'll start to see these effects at even wider quantum wells. Well, I said you could produce quantum wells quite easily. How would we do that? Well, the earliest way that this was done was electrostatically. For example, assume that I have a, a, a p-type piece of silicon, silicon wafer. Maybe I have a nice insulating layer on top of that. Silicon dioxide is the native oxide for silicon, and perhaps a metal plate on top of that. If I apply a positive voltage to the metal plate, You'll remember, maybe from freshman physics, that a positive voltage lowers the potential energy of electrons. So this positive energy on the plate will lower the energy, the, uh, the energy of electrons in the silicon. The positive energy on the plate will attract the negatively charged electrons, and they will pile up in a well, a very thin quantum well near the interface between the silicon and this insulating layer. This is the first place that people began to observe these quantum confinement effects in semiconductors. So it's also important to realize, though, that these electrons are free to move in the xy plane. They're only confined in the z direction. So these electrons are free to move about and travel. They simply can't move very well in the z direction. Well, this particular quantum well would not be described by the simple rectangular potential that we described earlier. The potential would look a little more uh, like a linear potential. There would be a set of quantized levels. They would be a little more difficult to solve. The differential equation involved here is a little more difficult to solve. Uh, the solutions are airy functions. The wave functions will look something like this. They'll penetrate a little outside the quantum well. They'll peek inside the quantum well. They look a little different from the simple quantum well we discussed where the mathematics was easy, but the qualitative features are very similar. Okay. Now, I just want to talk briefly about, we talked about here, it was easiest to solve this problem with infinitely high energy barriers on both sides because that made the boundary condition zero on both ends of the quantum wells. When we actually produce quantum wells, they'll often have a finite barrier, delta u, not infinite. And what that means is that the electrons will still have quantized energy levels, but the electrons are able to leak out a little bit. Now, if I were to ask you, how do the energy levels of this finite height quantum well compare with the energy levels of this infinite height quantum well? It would be relatively easy, I think, to understand that they would be a little bit lower. Why do I say that? Because the confinement is a little bit less. Remember, the tighter they're confined, the higher the energies. Here, because the electrons can leak out, they're not as confined as tightly, so their energies will be a little bit lower. It actually takes a little bit of work mathematically to, dis to uh, compute what the energy levels are but it's easy to appreciate qualitatively that they're a little bit less than you would calculate from this formula for an infinite barrier. This phenomenon is known as wave function penetration. Okay. Now, one way that we can produce these finite height quantum wells, I'll just mention, is by semiconductor epitaxy. That is growing single crystal layers of semiconductors, but growing different layers on top of each other. Aluminum gallium arsenide is a semiconducting alloy that has a band gap that is actually a little bit bigger, about a few tenths of an electron volt typically, than a pure gallium arsenide semiconductor. So by growing an aluminum gallium arsenide layer, and then a thin gallium arsenide layer, and then another aluminum gallium arsenide layer, the two external layers have wider band gaps, and they confine the electrons to be in the gallium arsenide. So as long as that gallium arsenide were thin, you know, a few 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers or so, we would be producing a quantum well for the gallium arsenide, uh, the electrons in the gallium arsenide. And note again, they're confined in the z direction, so it's hard for them to move in the z direction because of these big energy barriers, but they're free to move in the xy plane. Okay. So the question then would be, how do we describe the wave functions of these quantum confined electrons? Well, we would go back to our 
Schrodinger equation, we'd actually have to extend it to three dimensions. So the dx, the d psi dx squared becomes a del squared. Um, and we could solve this equation again using the technique of separation of variables. We could postulate that the solution of the wave function in the x, y, and z directions is the product of a solution that depends only on x times a solution that depends only on y times a solution that depends only on z. And if we plug that assumed solution into this three-dimensional wave equation, we'll see that the equation separates and it actually does work. We can solve the separate equations and the answer that we'll find is that the wave function is a plane wave propagating in the x direction times a plane wave propagating in the y direction times a different function in the z direction, the direction in which the confinement occurs. So I could write that as k parallel dot rho, where rho is a vector in the xy plane. So that's pretty much what we would expect if we were to look at this quantum well where electrons are confined thinly to a narrow region in the z direction, but free to propagate in the xy plane. And if I ask, what is the electron wave function in this region with cross-sectional area A? Well, we would expect the solution in the bulk, which is a wave going in all three directions, to change into a solution that looks like a particle in a box solution in the direction of confinement. That's the sine k sub z in the z direction, but times a plane wave in the xy plane. So that's there's no confinement in the xy plane, so we get our plane waves back. If I want to normalize these, I could normalize separately in the z direction and in the xy plane. And then when I integrate over all dimensions, this uh, wave would describe one electron in this quantum well within this area A. Now there's an important feature called subbands that I want to just mention briefly. That there are a number of different k's that are permitted to satisfy the boundary conditions at the top and the bottom of this quantum well. And that gives rise to a discrete set of energy levels associated with that confinement in the z direction. But remember that the electron is free to move in the xy plane. So the electron has kinetic energy in the xy plane. So it can have additional energy associated with that motion in the xy plane. So if we were to plot energy versus the wave vector in the xy plane, we would see that we have some discrete levels that come from the confinement in the z direction, but we also have some additional energy that comes from the motion in the xy plane. Okay, So the energy is given by the bottom of the band J that we happen to be talking about. We'll call these subbands because these are bands that have been induced in the conduction band because of the quantum confinement. So it's bottom of the subband plus the kinetic energy due to motion in the xy plane. So this is what we mean when we talk about subbands. All right, so we've talked a little bit about quantum confinement, which does become important from time to time in different types of semiconductor devices. So it's an example of where quantum mechanics manifests itself in a way that is too important to, to overlook or to wrap into some effective quantity like effective masses. The important points to remember is that when electrons are confined, their energy becomes quantized and their wave functions change. Uh, we can produce quantum confinements either with electric fields or by epitaxial growth surrounding a small band gap semiconductor with larger band gap semiconductors. The quantum confinement leads to subbands. So electrons may be free to move in the xy plane, but they have different minimum energies depending on which level they are quantized into in the confinement direction z. Now, all of the specifics depend on the shape of the quantum well, on the potential versus position of the confining potential. Uh, if the quantum well has a simple shape, like our particle in a box example, we can easily calculate what the energy levels are in terms of the width of the well. If the quantum well has a more complicated shape, then it will take more work to compute the wave functions and the energy levels. But the qualitative features can be easily understood in terms of this particle in a box understanding that we've developed here. So quantum confinement is one example of where quantum mechanics becomes important in semiconductors.
Another example is quantum mechanical tunneling and reflection, and we'll talk about those in the next lecture. Thank you.